has to have big things for you to bring it to... seated. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Hebrews 10, 35. You can go ahead and turn there in your Bibles. I originally was going to talk this morning more about the armor of God and continue on, but there's just been this scripture here that's just been rolling around in my heart. I go, don't know, I guess for about a week. I think it was last Saturday, maybe two weeks last Saturday, Mary and I were in the car, and, and you know, there's some old songs we used to sing, and one of them was about cast not away your confidence, and I just couldn't get away from it, and I just realized, you know, the, the couple things that the Lord has shown me as of late, you know, I, I, I shared this with you, and I know it was the Lord, but I shared with you about the drum, or uh, the, the drums, <laughs> no, the dream and the flood. And that how when the enemy comes in like a flood, the Lord would raise a standard. Right. Amen. Against him. And, 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 and I know as pastor, you know, since I shared that, I just know so many people who have had so many different things right now just coming against them in their life. Well, the Lord will give you something because he wants to encourage you and he wants to equip you with his word so that you're not caught off guard. Amen. And when it comes, you are ready and you can have confidence and you can have the joy in knowing that the Lord, amen, he already knew it. He already told you about it, that it was coming and it puts you in a position that you're ready and to know, listen, it's going to be all right. It doesn't matter what it looks like. And then last week, Last Saturday morning, you know, I was waking up, and let me just say this, because, you know, some people get so, so goofy in one sense, you know, I mean, every other, every other moment they're hearing from God, and, and, and that's not really how it works in me. You know, there's, the, the, there's, there's times, I'm convinced there's times it's my spirit that is speaking to me, because my spirit is born again, amen, and, 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 but, but, but there's times when you just know it's the Lord, you know, every, every dream you have doesn't mean that it's God, Amen. And if you think every dream you have is from God and you got to go all around the country to try to figure out what it means, then you probably just had too much pizza and had a pizza dream. Amen? When God gives you something, you'll know what it's about. And so uh, I just, I just uh, this, this wasn't a dream, but I was just waking up out of my sleep. You know, I just, uh, uh, for me, it seems like that's a lot of the times when, 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 when I hear from the Lord. And I think it's because, first of all, that I haven't, you know, engaged for the day. My mind hasn't even clicked into, you know, into first gear. I'm not thinking about what I need to do, where I need to go, need to get up, need to do this, that. I'm not thinking about anything. But in my heart, I heard this, that there was um, divine economic activity taking place. Say divine economic activity. And I got so excited because you have to understand divine means it's proceeding from God. And activity, we know what that means. It means that he's active. And he's active concerning your economics or your economic situation. And really, it's talking about uh, goods and services that are need, needed to supply the needs of mankind. That's one definition of it. But it also uh, talks about concerning uh, what are the economics concerning the scope of a project. And so that has extra, extra, you know. So, <laughs> so anyway, I just got so excited. And when God starts, starts to talk to you about that, that means that he is active right now. He's always active because he's God. He's always wanting to move. But right now, I just believe this with everything in me. We are in a season where God is actively getting involved in your finances, getting involved in your provision, getting involved in your life concerning your economic situation. 
I'm telling you, that should make you happy even if you're in a good position right now. And it should make you even happier if you're in a bad position. Just to know that God is moving on your behalf. He's active behind the scene. It might not look like it. You might not see it. You might not even see that it's manifested yet. But the good news is God is working. The angels are working, bringing the monies in. Things are being moved. Things are being shifted. Things are being changed. Things are being rearranged. Things are happening so that God can show himself mighty. God can show himself strong. God can show off and show himself big in the realm of your life and in your provision, in your finances. So in the very midst of that, have you found Hebrews 10.35? It says, cast not away therefore your confidence, which has great recompense of reward. The Amplified says it this way, do not therefore fling away your fearless confidence, for it carries a great and a glorious compensation of reward. The NIV says, so do not throw away your confidence, it will be richly rewarded. Mm. This version says this, therefore do not cast from you your confident hope, for it will receive a vast reward. See, there's a reward, but what did he say? He said, don't cast away your confidence. Now, when we look at that, that word cast means to fling off, to throw down, to put aside. You know, I know many of you in here because, you know, as your pastor, I know many of you in here that, 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 that you are sowing, that you're doing the things that you need to do. And listen, the Bible says, don't be weary in well-doing. Don't be weary. Don't, don't grow tired. Don't quit. Don't say that it doesn't work. Don't say it doesn't look like it's happening. Don't say that it doesn't seem like anything's changing. Don't grow weary in well-doing for in due season, you're going to reap. There's a due season. I said there's a due season. There is a season, and it is due, and I'm telling you, we are stepping into that due season right now, that season that is due. We're right on the threshold, and sometimes when you're right on the threshold, that's when you sense the most pressure. That's when you come up against the most opposition because you're right there getting ready to step over into that new threshold, that new place, that new realm, that new place of provision, that new place of blessing. You're right there at the very threshold. You can't be weary in well-doing. That means you keep doing what you've been doing. You keep sowing. You keep giving. You keep getting out of the boat and walk on the water. You keep pressing in. You keep praying. You keep believing God. Amen. So that word cast means to throw off from, to lay aside, to cast away. Now this word definition, or this definition of this word confidence this really struck me different. Because, you know, when I, think of, when I think of confidence, I'll give you what Webster's Dictionary says it is. It's a feeling or belief that you can do something well or succeed at something. It's a feeling or a belief that someone or something is good or has the ability to succeed at something. It's the feeling of being certain that something will happen or that something is true. Well, that's the American English language definition of what confidence means, but it's not what the Bible definition of confidence means. Amen. It can include it, but it's not what the Greek word confidence there means. Man, when I saw this, I saw something, and I think it will help each and every one of us. It's something that we already know. You know, I love the word of God, but when you read the epistles, the epistles were, were letters written to the church. I thank God for the epistles. I thank God for the gospels, you know. Those were written, those were written for us. But the epistles are letters that are written to us. They contain instruction for the church. Say, thank God for the church. Aren't you glad that the Lord gave you and left you written instruction for the church? He left us an owner's manual, praise the Lord, that we can access in reference. Come on, men. That we can access in reference uh, as needed and even when not needed. If we'll access it. Amen. 
But now notice this. It says this confidence, this Greek word, it refers to a bold, frank, forthright speech. Daring to speak what one believes with no hesitation or intimidation. The first thing the enemy wants to do is he wants to get you saying the wrong things. He wants you to be silent. He wants you not to speak up. He wants to take away your boldness. Listen. Cast not away your confidence for your confidence has great recompense of reward. I hope that sinks in. Cast not away your confidence for it has great recompense of reward. If you cast away your confidence, you lose the Watch out is right. You know what, what Chip shared? Man, that's, that's, that's a daily thing yeah. for me. Yeah. I mean, I, that, it's, it's changing my life. Right. Right. It's changing my life about what I'm going to allow to say out of my mouth. Right. Whether I'm going to speak blessing or whether I'm going to speak cursing. Right. Right. It's changing my life about how I'm going to think about certain people. And let me just say this and don't get mad and throw your, you know, your, well, I was going to say Bibles, but so many people use devices and phones. Just don't throw your electronics or your written Bibles at me, okay? But listen, one of the, one of the greatest places to find half-truths and rumors is on your little devices and your social networks. Come on, don't shout me down now because I'm preaching real good. And we need to be careful of that. I just recently came across something, and, and it felt like this group of ministers were embracing a certain thing. And I'm like, man, I'm like, they're embracing that? You know, I mean, who do they think? They're crazy. That's wrong. They don't, they don't got no Bible for that. And I'm just going on and on, and everybody's posting about how they're doing this, that, and the other. And then I came across of a recording where one of the men that everybody was beating down on shared what really happened. Yeah. And it was not what everybody was posting and, 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 and smacking the man around about. We need to be careful because I was going to hook up my voice with agreement with something I read. And then when I heard it from the man, the own man's mouth, it was different than anything that he ever said or embraced. And then what happens is we share it. Dear Lord, we, I mean, we shared. I mean, we got the potential to, you know, hit share or whatever it is or tweet or, what, you know, whatever the, or whatever the you know, or, or mass email or text. Or, I mean, we, we have the ability to share these things. And by doing that, listen, we are hindering our own place in God. My Bible tells me that God himself will make his ministers to stand. And we got to be very careful. And I'm not just talking about ministers. I'm talking about our brothers and our sisters in the Lord, whether in the ministry or not. we got to be careful. We just don't jump on the bandwagon and start sharing this stuff and start letting this thing come out of our mouth because we don't know all the facts. We don't know the truth. Right. Amen. 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 So we cannot cast away our confidence. Why? What has a great recompense of reward? Our confidence. So let me say it this way. We cannot cast away our bold, frank, forthright speech. We cannot cast away our boldness to speak without hesitation and our boldness to speak without intimidation because that is what is going to bring you great recompense of reward. Have you ever noticed when everything comes against you and it looks contrary to what you are believing God for, the first thing that you want to do is shut your mouth? Isn't it? 
You either want to shut your mouth or you, and don't say anything because the enemy will say, why are you talking like that? Why are you saying what you're saying? It's not working for you. It's, I don't, you know, the enemy will tell you, I don't see any of a fruit of it in your life. And you're talking like you have that fruit. My Bible says, now let the weak say they are strong. Who's supposed to be saying they're strong? The weak weak are supposed to say they're strong. Now let the poor say, I am rich. Who's supposed to say I am rich? The poor. Well, why would the poor say I am rich when they're poor? They have to speak it. You have to speak it out of your mouth. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, think of this. Faith is the substance. Do you know another word for substance? Greek it out. Confidence. Confidence. The word is substance. The word is substance. We know according to Hebrews 11 that the world was formed by things that are not seen. What was he talking about? He said it was the word of God. The word is not seen, but yet it's substance. And that substance, you don't see it, but it's there. And that substance is actually what formed the world and what created the world. It was the word of God. It was the word spoken by God. It was the words that God said. That is what formed the world. It was not seen. It was nothing. But when God spoke it, it was. You think about it. Look at this definition about confidence. What's the number one cue, if you would, or sign or trait when you get around somebody that is confident? You listen how they speak. You listen what comes out of their mouth. You listen to what they're saying. You listen to to what they're speaking, and it will exude confidence. They're confident. They're confident about what they're saying. Number one trait, confidence. Cast not away your bold speaking. Let's go here a little bit further. Mark 11, 22. So Jesus answered and said to them, have faith in God. You know that where it says have faith in God? You know what that really says? Have the God kind of faith. It means have the faith that God has. And it's talking about exactly what we were just speaking about. That he created something out of his words. For assuredly I say to you, whosoever says to this mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes those things that he says will be done, he will have whatever he says. Therefore, I say unto you, whatsoever things you ask when you pray, believe that you receive them and you shall have them. Now notice, you have to believe that those things that you say is what you're going to have. If you're going to speak doubt, if you're going to speak poverty, if you're going to speak sickness, if you're going to speak defeat, and that's what's going to continually come out of your mouth, then you are going to have whatsoever you say. But if you have the God kind of faith, you will not find one place where God ever spoke anything that was full of doubt and unbelief. You will never find one place where Jesus himself ever said anything that came out of his mouth that was full of doubt and unbelief. And one of the reasons why is he didn't say anything unless he heard his father say it. Amen. What would God say? What would God say? What would Jesus say? What would God say? When they bring a problem to him, he didn't talk all about the problem. He gave them the answer. When a storm was coming and the winds and the waves were beating on the boat, he didn't get up and start worrying and start talking about how bad the storm was. We've never seen anything like this. Oh, no, he just got up and he spoke the answer. He said, peace, be still. And it ceased. The storm ceased. How are you going to stop your storm? You're going to stand up and you're going to speak. You're going to say, peace, be still. 
You're going to speak what God said. Now notice this. He says there, he says that you shall have whatever you say. Let me just hit this for a minute. Because it's whatever you say. You're going to have whatever you say. Oh, we need to get a hold of that. You are going to have whatever you say. You're not going to have what your mama said about you. You're not going to have what your dad said about you. You're not going to have what your teacher said about you. You're not going to have what your neighbor said about you. You don't even have to have what the doctor said about you. You don't have to have what the banker said about you. You don't have to have what your employer said about you. You can have whatever you say. Amen. You've got to do the same. Some people, oh, no, oh, they can't say that. They're binding me. They can't bind you in Jesus' name. They can't stop you by what they say. The only thing that will ever stop you is what you say out of your mouth or what you don't say out of your mouth. Thank God you can have whatever you say. Just say right now, I'm strong. strong. Say right now, I'm rich. rich. Say right now, I have peace. peace. Say right now, I'm provided for. Matthew 17, 19 through 22. Then came the disciples to Jesus apart. He said, why could not we cast him out? Talking about a devil they were casting out. Jesus said unto them, because of your unbelief. Unbelief. We call ourselves believers. But we have unbelief. Believers believe. What a revelation, huh? Believers believe. Right? Unbelievers don't believe. They're non-believers. But believers believe. Because of your unbelief, for verily I say unto you, if you have faith as the grain of a mustard seed, what shall you do with it? You shall say unto this mountain, mountain be removed. Go yonder henceforth. Amen? Be cast into the sea. And, listen, in God's word, this is non-negotiable. It doesn't say, and it might be removed. Does it say that it might be removed? When you speak to the mountain, might it be removed? No! If you have grain of faith as the size of a grain of mustard seed. A mustard seed, I I saw my first one just recently from Roger, Roger and Laura. And that thing is puny. Man, you know what? I could hold it up there and you would have a hard time seeing it from the front row. It's like a little speck. If you had faith, like a little speck, you would say, listen, if you don't have enough faith to move your mouth, you're not going to have enough faith to move a mountain. You've got to speak to it. You speak to everything. You speak to symptoms in your body. You've got to speak to them. Well, I don't feel like I have enough faith. Do you have enough faith as the grain of a mustard seed? You've got enough faith. And besides that, listen, as you begin to speak the word of God, faith begins to come. And the more you speak it, you are hearing it. And the more that you hear it, the more you're going to speak it. And that mustard seed faith is going to grow, praise God. That mustard seed faith is going to expand in the name of Jesus. So instead of speaking to that headache in your body, when something even more serious attaches itself to your body, guess what? You have faith. And you know the first thing that faith has to do is faith has to speak the word of God. Well, how come you keep talking about speaking to symptoms? Because that's what Jesus did. Peter did it. Peter's mother, or Peter, Jesus did it with Peter's mother-in-law. She had a headache. And he rebuked it. How do you rebuke something? You have to speak to it. He rebuked the headache. He spoke to the headache in the name of Jesus, in his own name. Right? All right, Romans 4, 17. You getting anything out of this? 
People say, well, how, how, how long do I got to speak it before it changes? How long do I got to speak it before, but be, before I see it? Till it does. As a matter of fact, Brother Hagin used to point out to us that in Mark 11, 22 through 24, that there's three times more, more saying than believing. You believe once and you say three times. Amen. Pastor, I'm just, I'm just a realist. I'm just into reality. I'm not going to say something I don't see. Well, you're going to continue to see what you see. Amen. God watches over his word to perform it. There's not one word of God that will return void. It will prosper whereunto it is sent. Romans 4. You probably found it. I haven't yet. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations in the presence of him whom he believed. God who gives life to the dead and calls those things which be not as though they were. He calls those things that do not exist as though they exist. It's easy to call it when you see it. Because then it's existed. It's in existence. You see it. But we have to call those things that be not as though they were. This principle, look what God did. Abram, you're now Abraham, father of many nations. He was 99 years old. We're not going to have a biology class today. But he was 99 years old. Sarah was up there. They were past the age of being able to have children. But here, God began to call him by changing his name, Father of Many Nations. He began to call it as though it already existed, even though it didn't exist. He was not the father of any when God told him this. The, and not the father of none. He was the father of none. Think of that. I don't know what that would be. I don't know what name that means. But he called him Abraham, the father of many. Yeah. He began to call him that. Abraham's name was changed every time he identified himself. Hello, I'm the father of many nations. What's your name? Uh, my name is father of many nations. Amen. Amen. Calling those things that be not as if they already existed. Past tense. Say, I'm rich. I'm rich. Say, I'm healed. I'm healed. Say, I'm blessed. I'm blessed. Say, I have peace. peace. Say, I have joy. This version says he speaks of the non existent things that he has foretold and promised. As if they already existed. I like this one now. Do you got King James you can put up there for me? Go to the next one. Who against hope believed in hope. That means by looking at it, it was impossible, it was hopeless, it could never change, it was useless, it would have all been in vain. But against hope, he believed in hope. Yeah. Why? <laughs> that he might become the father of many nations according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith. Now he's going to tell you how not to be weak in faith here. Yeah. Right? If you don't want to be weak in faith, then there's some things you can no longer consider. Amen. If you want to stay weak in faith, then there's some things you can consider, and it will keep you weak in faith. And he was not weak in faith. He was not weak in faith because he didn't consider his own body now dead. That's faith. Because your head is screaming to you, Abraham, your body's dead. 
Your mind is trying to figure it all out. This is impossible. These things cannot happen. But Abraham said, I'm not going to consider those things. I'm not considering that my body's dead, and I'm not going to consider yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. How does that fit with you? you got to quit considering where you are at right at this moment. you got to quit considering the symptoms that are in your body. You got to quit considering where you are in life. You got to quit considering what your education is. You got to quit considering where your socioeconomic level is right now in your life. You got to quit considering all those things. You got to quit considering what your bank account says. You got to quit considering all these other things. Consider not those things, but consider what? Let's go further. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief. but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. He staggered not. He staggered not at the promise. There's some of you, you're in here, and you can't see beyond where you are right now. But my Bible promises you that he's got a better place for you. My Bible promises you that no matter where you are socioeconomically, he's got a higher place for you. My Bible tells me no matter what you're going through in your body, no matter what the symptom is, he's got something better for you. And you have to consider the promises and quit considering those things. And he staggered not at the promise of God. I mean, we got astronauts. We got juggernauts. Like one man said, we need some stagger knots. Amen. Amen. We need some stagger knots in the body of Christ. Yeah. We can't got to quit staggering. Amen. I see that promise. I see it in the word of God, but I don't see how it's ever going to happen in my life. And it causes you to stagger. That means it causes you to waver. Every time a thought comes, it causes you to waver. Every time a circumstance comes contrary to what you are believing God for, it causes you to stagger. You got to quit staggering. Glory to God. You've got to consider the promise of God. You know why a lot of people are staggering? Because you're looking at the wrong thing. You try walking, you try walking, and you're always looking behind you. And I know these camera people, they're pretty good, you know. But I mean, you try, you try walking, and, and, and you're always looking behind you, you're going to be staggering. You're not going to be able to walk the straight line. You're not going to be stay on the path that God has you. You can't be looking to the right and looking to the left. You've got to keep pressing in. That promise is mine. You've got to start hooking your mouth up what God has said, what God has promised, and speak in agreement with it, and set your face like flint. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the right. Don't walk by sight. Amen. Just continue to press on to what God has for you. Say, I'm not going to be a stagger knot. Amen. Let's go to the next verse. And being fully persuaded. That's that confidence thing again there. Being fully persuaded that what he had promised. I mean, are you fully persuaded? Are you... I'm talking, are you fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was also able to perform it? Fully persuaded. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not talking about half persuaded. Because if you're only half persuaded, you're a stagger, you're a staggerer instead of a stagger not. Amen. Listen to this, what James said. He said that we're not supposed to be double-minded, that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let not that man think he shall receive anything from the Lord. Double, double-minded. The Bible says that, that, that he wavers. He wavers like the, 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 the wave on a sea. He's wavering. You can't waver. You can't let every wave, you can't let every wind that blows get you to waver and get you to go and rock and go back and forth. You've got to be a stagger knot, bless God. You've got to press in. You've got to grab a hold of it. You've got to refuse to let go of it. You've got to say, I'm going to not cast away my confidence. I'm making a decision today. I'm not casting away my confidence. I'm making a decision today that I am not going to cast away my bold, my bold confession of faith. 
I'm making a decision today that no matter what it looks like, I am going to tell it what the Word of God says. Everything I'm facing, I'm not going to talk the problem. I'm going to talk the answer. Glory to God. I'm believing for big things. I'm believing for mind-blowing big things. They're so, they're so big, I can't, I can't even wrap my, my little pea brain part way around it. They're too big. But I have confidence in God. Amen. I've got the word of God. I'll tell you what gives you confidence is when you know that, we, that you are believing him for the right things for the right reasons. Man, that gives you confidence. Because you're believing God for the same thing that he wants you to have. Woo! Glory to God. When you know you're believing him for the exact same thing that he wants you to have, you can be bold. You don't, have to, you don't have to worry about, Lord, I hope it's your will. You go and you say, bless God, I know it's your will. I know it's your will, and I'm asking you for it now. And I'm not casting away my confidence. The devil wave flags all over trying to distract you, get your attention on stuff. You just forget about all that. I'm not considering that. I'm considering God. I'm considering the one who made the promise. Woo! Man, you consider the one who made the promise? Is there anything too hard for God? Is there anything that God can't do? Is there anything that is impossible for God? No, I'm considering he's the one who has given me his word. He's the one who's given me his promises. He's the one that has to bring it to pass. I'm preaching myself happy today. I tell you, I'm... This is the thing. This is the good news. If he's got big things for this church, if he's got big things for this ministry, then that means he has to have big things for you to bring it to... To bring it to pass. Glory to God. Big things. Big things. Not minimal things. Not things we can do on our own. Not things that we can do without the Lord. But we've got his promises. We've got his word. I sense, I, listen, I sense a lot of you are, are fully persuaded. You're fully persuaded. Then listen, do not cast away your confidence. Do not cast away your bold profession of faith. Do not allow this thing to hook up with the natural mind and the natural circumstances. You keep it hooked up to your spirit. You keep it hooked up to the Holy Ghost. You keep it hooked up to the Word of God. You keep it hooked up to the promises of God. Say it again. Say, I'm rich. I'm, rich. I'm, healed. I'm healed. I'm prosperous. I'm, prosperous. I'm, blessed. I'm blessed. I have peace. I have, peace. I have joy. I have joy. I've, been I've been redeemed. The promises of God, promises they're, of God. Yes. they're yes and they're amen, amen. to them that believe. I believe. I believe. I'm, fully I'm fully persuaded. I'm not casting away my profession of faith, my confidence. I remember years ago, Mary and I, I mean, we were just, 
we were at a place in our life, we just, we, we were believing God. I mean, for everything, we were just at that place. We had to believe God. Our outgo exceeded our income. So our upkeep wanted to be our downfall. And I remember, you know, things would happen. And it come against us, you know, it just come against us financially. There's things that need to be repaired or the car wouldn't work, things that, and you know what? We made an attitude adjustment. And this is what we'd say in the midst of it. Bless God, another opportunity Amen. to believe God and to see him come through for us again. Amen. It's not what the enemy wanted us to say. What we're doing, we're getting our eyes off of the problem. We're getting our eyes off where we're at, and we're putting them on Jesus. Yeah. Glory to God. I'll close with this. God honors faith. See, that's what you have to understand, that without faith, Hebrews eleven six. 6, without faith, it's impossible to please God. For those that come to him must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder. He's a what? Rewarder. He's a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But notice, it's the faith. Because it's the faith that pleased him. He, you know what? When, when you get out of the boat and walk on the water, it pleases him. It pleases him. When you believe him in the midst of all impossibility, it pleases him. He said, look at that one. I'm pleased with them. In fact, the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. He's seeking those whom he can show himself strong on their behalf, whose heart is upright. Now, let's go. Oh, I'll say it. Whose heart is upright. One translation says loyal. Loyal to him. How do you know when somebody's loyal to you? You listen to what is coming out of their mouth. Loyal. <laughs> See, we don't know how, I don't, I don't know, <laughs> I don't know how God's going to do what, 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 what we have in our heart, what Mary and I, I don't know. I don't know how he's going to do it, but I just know he's going to do it. I know, I know right now that there's some divine economic activity taking place. So I, I just, I just know he's going to do it. I can't figure it out with my mind. I'm not even going to go there. I wouldn't be there very long even if I went. Yeah. So, but the things of God, they're deep. Amen. Right? right. So I, 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 I'm not going to go there. But what I can do is I can continually to go to God. I can watch my confidence. I can keep my confidence level correct by what's coming out of my mouth. I'm not going to cast away my good profession, my good confession of faith, calling those things that be not as though they were. Right? But he's looking for faith. I remember, I'll close, with this, I'll, I'll close with this story about Mary and I. Years ago, we'd rented this house. Did we just, uh, were we getting ready to go to Bible school or did we just get back? I can't remember. We're somewhere. The one on Dorothy. We are getting ready to go to Bible school. Man, I mean, in the natural, there's no way we could do it. Two kids, you know, packing up, just going by faith. Finances weren't there to do it. But the Lord said, go. But we had rented this house, and uh, this house was a mess. I mean, it was, it, was, uh, it was worse than a mess. It was, I mean, it was nasty. I mean, I, I won't go into all the details, but it was, it was nasty. But we walked into it, and the price was right, and it looked like, you know, it had some potential. That There was some, what do they call it on HGTV? There were some good bones there or something. I don't know. Either that or we were boneheads. I don't know which. But, but uh it just needed a whole lot. And so we, we you know, we, we rent, we talked to the, talked to the landlord. We never got to talk to the owner. We got to talk to his secretary. And um, they agreed that they would buy us paint. So we got paint and we're painting it. And my mom and dad and I, Kim and Mark came over. We were all just, you know, getting it all painted up and, and cleaning it up. Lots of cleaning. And it had this carpet. I mean, this carpet was so nasty. I mean, you would not want to get down and pray and suck rug. Because it was so gross, I mean, you didn't even want to walk in there without having shoes on. And, they, and, and so we knew somebody, he came and he cleaned it. He, was a, he went to our church, and he felt so bad. He's like, that's all the better we can do with this carpet. I'm not even going to charge you. It was that nasty. 
And I remember one night, Mary and I were up praying. I remember right where we were. It's interesting when you, when you just see God move. And, 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 and we were right by our dining room, living room. We grabbed hands. And we said, you know what? We're just going to believe God for carpet. And so we grabbed hands. We prayed. We agreed for carpet. And I don't know. It was just a short time, matter of days. Mary's going out the door, and this, this old lady, pull, elderly lady pulls up in a big four-door car. And she just stops in front of the house, and she's just looking at the house, just looking at it. And so Mary went out and said, you know, can I help you? What's going on? She goes, well, I used to live in this house. Mary said, wow, that's great. We've done a lot of work to it, and, you know, straightened out. And, and uh, she said, my son Clint owns it. Well, Clint was a, a, an attorney in Lakeland. And, uh, of course, we never got to talk to Clint. We had to talk to Mary. His secretary's name was Mary. And uh, my wife Mary said to her, she goes, you know, it's, we've, we've done everything we can, but it really needs carpet. The carpet's bad. And this is what she said. She said, you call Clint on the phone and you tell him his mother said to put new carpet in the house. <laughs> you know what? She called Clint, actually talked to Mary. And, and uh, she said, Clint's mom came by today, and she said that Clint's supposed to pay to put new carpet in this house. And she called us back, and she said, you go pick out your carpet, and we'll pay for it and have it installed. <laughs> now, I shared all that. I shared all that because only God could orchestrate this elderly lady driving down memory lane Come on now. Probably didn't even realize, didn't even understand. Well, I don't even know why I want to go buy this house today. You know, probably didn't even enter her mind. She's driving by the house, and there's Mary coming out the front door at the same time. Oh, glory to God. And this is the thing. When he does things like that, if he did it once. I mean, you look at David and Goliath. He said, God, you did it once. You did it with the lion, you did it with the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine isn't going to be any different. Right. Amen. Well, let's stand to our feet. Well, hello, and thank you for joining us today. Today, I want to introduce you to somebody, and her name is Chris Miller. And Chris Miller is here on staff at Waterloo Worship Center. And one of the things that she does is she is our outreach coordinator. And I've just asked Chris if she would just take some time today and just kind of share her heart and, and share the vision that Waterloo Worship Center has concerning reaching out in our community. So, Chris, why don't you just go ahead and share the things that are on your heart today? Well, you know, outreach, is, of course, you know, is a big part of Waterloo Worship Center. It's a big part of what we do, and it's, it's about reaching outside of the four walls. It's not just about us coming in and getting to know God for ourselves. Then we take it a step further. We go out and we tell the world that, hey, there's a God that's alive and well who wants to touch you and change your life. And we do that through, uh, we do outreaches, and what we do is a lot of times we'll get bait. And a lot of that bait, what we call bait, is prizes. We'll give away iPod touches, TVs, just a whole array of things, toys, cash donations, bill pays. We'll give out a whole different variety of things, and we'll go, we'll fly all the week before. We'll invite people to come in, and we believe that when we do that, they're drawn by the bait. But not only that, they're going to hear the Word of God when they come in. You know, and that's so important because really... That's what it is exactly. It's to get people to attend the event. And when they show up to the event, they don't know what the event is really about. Right. They come because they believe, hey, I have an opportunity to win something. You know, everybody likes to win something. Right. And so they'll show up thinking, man, that's great. I have an opportunity to win something. But what they don't realize is they're, they have something that is so much greater than any prize they could ever win. And it's eternal life. That's right. And so that's what we offer at these, out, at these in reaches or these outreaches out in the communities. We are offering people the opportunity that we can share the message 
they can hear it and they can respond to the gospel and give their hearts to the Lord Jesus. That's right. That's right. And not only do we do the outreaches, we also, the second and fourth Saturday of every single month, we're out there, we're hitting the streets. We had extreme teams that were going out on the streets even at night. We go out we go out in front of the bars. We didn't go inside of them, but we would go outside of them and we would lead people to the Lord. And you'd be surprised at how many people, if we will just open our mouth and speak, how many people will say yes to Jesus. That is so true. And you know what's so encouraging about it? You know, as, as, a, as the pastor of, of a local church, is that, you know, um, as a pastor, your heart is to see your church grow. And your heart is to see people come to your church that you have ministered to and of course new people because you want to minister to new people and you know I've, I've talked to a lot of pastors and of course their main concern is well how many people come to your church as, as a result of that and you know and that is important I understand that as a pastor but the most important thing is how many of these people are going to be in that cloud of witnesses one day That's right. because That's they said right. yes to Jesus that day. Whether, whether they ever attend my church or not, I can't control that element of it, but I can certainly have, have, a, have a heartbeat to go out and to reach the lost and have teams that go out and share this good message with the people and give them that opportunity to say yes to Jesus. That's right. And you know what? It's, it's, in one sense, yes, it's about building the church. We want them in the church. We want to disciple them. It is about that. But it's about building the kingdom of God. And we don't know. We go out, you know, we go out on the streets a lot. And this last outreach, I had a couple young men come up to me. And they said, hey, do you remember us? You led us to the Lord in front of a gas station. And I kind of remember that. I remembered their faces. I'm like, yeah, yeah, I remember you. They go, we want to get filled with the Holy Ghost and like that. I mean, they were just... They received the Holy Spirit so quickly. Well, I didn't actually ever see the fruit of that when I led them to the Lord. So, I just led them. Yes. And we have teams that do that. We have so many people here in our church that have a heart to do that. We, do, Young and old, we had one lady go into the nursing home. Oh, wow. And she was telling us about a gentleman who wasn't doing well. And she went into his room, and she said she could just sense death in the room. And she led him to the Lord. He received Jesus. And the next time, two weeks later, because we go to the nursing homes every other Saturday, and two weeks later when she went back there, that man had went home to be with the Lord. Wow. So if you think about that, well, what if all we cared about, well, you know what? This guy's old, and he can't come and build our church anyway, so let's just move on. No, that's not our heart. That's not... That's not what this church and what the vision of Waterloo Worship Center is about. We're about people, about not only changing lives, but going out into outside of the four walls and saying, you know what, there's a God, he's alive, he's real, he loves you, and he will change your life. That's right. You know, I was thinking just recently, we had an inreach right here at Waterloo Worship Center, and I was thinking of these, this, this young man that, that actually attended, and uh, he, he gave his heart to Jesus, and and right after that, the following week, we had, uh, we had a special guest come in, and we were doing a youth event, and that young man came and brought some of his friends to that youth event, and his friends responded to the message and to the altar call, and his friends gave their heart to Jesus too. You know, you can just see how, 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 how we can believe God, and we do as a church, how we can believe God to shake Waterloo, to shake to shake the Cedar Valley, to shake this region just because of that, because you just see the multiplication at work because of that one young man and how he was touched and then how he brought his friends and how his friends were touched and they can go out and touch their friends and their family. And I'm telling you, Jesus is coming back soon and he's coming back for a church that's ready and the church that's glorious. And I don't know about you. Well, I do know about you. Your heart is that you don't want people left behind. You don't That's want people right. to be able to say, why didn't anybody ever tell me? Right. You know, I don't want one person in Waterloo, Cedar Falls, the Cedar Valley, this region, I don't want one person to stand before the Lord and say, nobody ever told me yeah. that I had to receive Jesus. Nobody ever told me this good news. That's right. That's right. And you know, Pastor, you've trained us very well to know that it's not just about us. It's about going out. But, you know, it's when we go out, after we go out on the streets, it's in the marketplace. It's where people live, you know, where they go to work. You know, when you're going out on the streets and you're being trained on, you know, it's just really simple to share the gospel. Then when you get out on the streets or out in your, at your workplace, you'll be more bold. And that's how the church ultimately grows, the church of Jesus Christ. It grows by us going out and opening our mouth. That's exactly right. You know, if, 
If we think that we can sit back and wait for people to come into the church, right. then we're missing the boat. We have to go outside the four walls of the church, yes. lead them to Jesus, and then we bring them into the local church so that they can be discipled and yes. they can hear the word of God and they can make uh, com uh, connections with like precious believers of the faith, you know. Yeah. And so I just, I just see this, this, you know, people wonder how in the world, how in the world are we ever going to have a great awakening? Well, I believe this is how we're going to have it. That's right. That's because right. Because we're, we're, we're going outside and we're doing the works of Jesus out in the marketplace. That's right. That's right. And you know, the body too, so many people want to be used, you know, and I'll be honest, I hear people say a lot, they, you know, they believe God has, there's a call of God on their life and they want the pulpit, but you know, it starts where you're at. Right. And when you go out, we've been out on the streets and I've seen people, all of a sudden the gifts of spirit are in operation and they got a word of knowledge for someone and that person goes, how did you know that about me? And they're being used by God. So it doesn't just bless the people and lead others to the Lord. It blesses the body that goes out and shows them that, you know what, I am important to the body of Christ. I am a part of the body of Christ. God does want to use me. Yes. And you know, I, I think every believer has this in their heart that there's nothing more awesome yeah. than to know that the Lord has used you. That's right. There's no other feeling. That's you know, right. even, even as a pastor, the, the greatest joy that I have is when I see people respond. I thank God for all these other things, but that's all about getting them to respond yeah. to God and to the things of God. And so, you know, I just can't say this enough. Uh, Waterloo Worship Center, we have a heart to reach out into the community we have a heart to see this region sh region shaked, and and you know I just I just want to thank you, Chris, for all your hard work. I mean, you put a lot of time and effort into doing <clears throat> all the outreach and everything that has to take place, and I just want to thank you for it. And I just know there's there's eternal fruit that's going to go to every everyone's Amen. account when we get to heaven. There's going to be fruit there. There's going to be a soul winner crown. There's going to be people who are going to come up to us and say, I never met you personally, but I was there at that inreach, or I was there at that outreach. You prayed for me, and, and the reason they're going to be there, and the only reason, is because somebody shared the good news with them, and they received it. That's right. Amen. Well, thank you for joining us today, and God bless you. to have big things for you to bring it to He's the one who's given me his promises. He's the one that has to bring it to pass. <laughs>